name is Vince Cerf. I'm Google's Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist. And although I'm by no means an expert on JavaScript, I really appreciate the opportunity to just spend some time with you today and to talk a bit about software, its production, and some of the side effects of our increasing dependency on uh, everything, it seems, that can be programmed. Uh, like many of you, I used to make a living uh, either writing software or at least designing it, specifying it and perhaps overseeing uh, the, uh, and managing the production uh, of software testing and use. Uh, I will say that in the course of my now 50 plus year career, I've come to the conclusion that of the many endless frontiers that, uh, that we confront, software is certainly one of them. Uh, there really isn't any limit to what you can do with software except the limitations on figuring out how to write, write the software, how to program it. And in, in a sense, JavaScript um, is evidence of that in the following sense. Uh, it's a programming language which, which has been widely learned by a cohort of people, many of whom probably were not uh, trained initially to be programmers. It's a little bit like um, spreadsheets, which uh, opened up programming of a sort, uh, and sometimes a very complex sort, to a collection of people who don't have degrees in computer science or computer engineering or electrical engineering. And that's important because it just broadens the base of uh, productivity. Software is a really powerful tool that enhances our ability to make things happen. And of course, because it can be easily replicated, uh, you know, one piece of software can run on you know, millions of computers and therefore uh, uh, expand the total capacity of what that one piece of software can do, which is one of the reasons that software is such an important uh, concept and tool that uh, we've uh, come to value uh, and to take advantage of. So um, I, it seems to me that, uh, that there are some other aspects of JavaScript that are worthy of noting. Uh, one of them is that it typically runs on an interpreter. And why is that important? Well, think of some of the other things that we rely on that require uh, a runtime environment in order to be useful. So examples of that would include spreadsheets. Uh, it would certainly would include HTML, HTML5, and XML, which requires a pretty complex browser to correctly interpret uh, the uh, page descriptions, web page descriptions that we download uh, when we go to a website. And it's that, uh, runtime environment, uh, which is important not only for the fidelity of the result, but it's also important because it's a source of potential hazard. Uh, it's not just the software itself, not just the JavaScript itself that may be uh, misprogrammed, but if the interpreters don't work properly, it's another, possi uh, another possible avenue for uh, harmful intervention. It's just another layer in the layer cake of, of uh, structure here, which goes all the way down to the bare metal uh, when you finally get to the hardware. Although in our environment, in the cloud-based environments, there are many, many layers between the JavaScript interpreter and the actual computer that's running code, because there may be several layers of virtual machines, uh, which are, again, their own kind of interpreter. So these many layers of software offer plenty of opportunity for mischief. Uh, and that should be top of mind uh, for people who are uh, writing JavaScript and any other code, uh, that it has to work not only because you wrote the code correctly, but the environment in, in which it's running is also properly uh, secured uh, and properly vetted for uh, correct operation. So um, let me just start out uh, by saying that uh, as you pursue implementations of JavaScript applications, in the back of your mind, safety and security should be a very, very high priority. You're not necessarily responsible for the runtime environment uh, that, that you're writing for. Other people typically are responsible for that. And so there is a shared responsibility among a broad programming community in order to make software safe and secure. Uh, that extends all the way uh, to the consumers uh, who run this software on their laptops and desktops or in the cloud, for that matter. Uh, if their uh, machines are not kept up to date, then it's possible uh, that the code that they're running that you wrote will be um, interfered with. 
by someone who has managed to sneak some software onto a laptop or a desktop or a mobile or something else. And you don't have any control over that. So there are bounds to your responsibilities, but they should be uh, in the back of your head when you're writing the software. And you should be asking questions about the um, conditions under which your own code is likely to run, even if you're not in a position to absolutely guarantee that the uh, framework in which the software is running is, in fact, safe and secure. Uh, it won't hurt for you to be vocal about this, by the way. Uh, another thing which uh, I worry about is, uh, is called supply chain attacks, and you can see where I'm headed with this. Um, one possibility, of course, is that uh, the platform on which your JavaScript is running has already been penetrated. And uh, the result is that whatever your code does doesn't uh, do what you expect it to do because there's something else in the runtime environment which is interfering. Either it's changing uh, what the code does or it's taking information from uh, what your software has done and sending it to a place it doesn't belong. For example, if somebody's logging in or somebody is supplying credentials of one kind or another, um, or, or even just trying to update uh, a database and the software maliciously goes in and makes changes to that database. Scary example, what if it's your health record and it decides to change the blood type? So if you ever have to have a transfusion, you'll die because you have the wrong kind of blood. Those are the sorts of things that, uh, that worry at least some people. <clears throat> One of my uh, colleagues said that he was less worried about uh, the safety and security of the basic system than he was in the accuracy and integrity of his medical records, which meant he was digital signatures were his friend here when it came to uh, the electronic health records that his doctors might be re uh, relying on uh, during treatment. So I, I, here I think uh, you have either a direct responsibility if you're responsible for some of that runtime environment or some of the uh, supply chain that supports the JavaScript execution environment. Probably a lot of you uh, are not only familiar with, but you may even be relying on open source libraries or even private libraries uh, in order to uh, ease your ability to produce code. And here again, suspicion is your friend. Uh, we need to scrutinize those open sources. The problem that uh, I see is that many people look at open source and say, well, uh, since it's open, everybody can see the bugs and they've all been found. And of course, the problem with that argument is that everybody assumes that everybody else has found the bugs and nobody bothers looking, in which case you may be ingesting really buggy code from an open source library. Or someone could deliberately go in because it's open source and make modifications to it that cause it to, uh, to do what you don't expect it to do. So in some sense, the power of open source, which is enabling, is also uh, a potential big hazard unless the source code is in fact uh, correctly uh, written uh, and, and performs as, uh, as you expect and doesn't do some extra things that you didn't expect. This also uh, goes to compilers, for example, because another very sneaky attack is to go change the compiler so that you look at the source code and it looks okay, and then you compile it, but the compiler has been modified to produce some additional software that you don't know about because you can't see it in the source code. And when it executes, it does some things that you weren't expecting it to do. Uh, once again, another hazard that, uh, that uh, some people need to be uh, responsible for uh, looking for, uh, notably the people who are um, either uh, writing the compilers or supplying the compilers. So it, you know, it's amazing how many different hazards uh, we can imagine and how many uh, different parties might have a role to play in um, increasing the safety and security of the environment in which the software you write uh, is executed. Um, I think I also want to uh, draw your attention to the fact that the, the power of software is so beguiling. It, it's flexible, it's changeable, it's uh, replicable. Uh, you, you can, as I said before, run it on millions of machines. However, as we become increasingly dependent on the functionality of software, including the software you write, then we become uh, dependent on something which could be quite brittle. And so I worry a little bit about, it, actually more than a little bit, about a society that has become extremely dependent 
on a variety of uh, software artifacts that basically have to work in order for our daily lives to function cleanly, smoothly, neatly, and as expected. Uh, so now uh, we need to give some thought to um, how to write our software and how to create environments so that there is a significant amount of resilience in the system, backup capability, the ability to do things manually if you can't do them automatically. Uh, I'm sure you can make up quite a long list of things that we could do in order to build systems that are uh, software-based systems that are resilient in the face of potential failures. That's sort of like the Internet of Things where everybody gets all excited about being able to tell your bath, the toilet to flush or ask the refrigerator what it has inside. Uh, and what we don't necessarily think about is the possibility that our house stops working because the Internet connection broke. We, nobody wants that. And so, again, resilience and uh, ability to deal with uh, failure modes uh, turn out to be really important. There's, so we have a society that could be increasingly brittle unless we think our way through that. Another thing which I do worry about is that the increasing dependence on software in order to do anything uh, also produces uh, a high risk factor over time. So uh, to give you a recent example, Adobe has decided to stop supporting the Flash uh, application, which many, many people used in order to create you know, fancy uh, and compelling documents and animations and things of that kind. Uh, the problem is that the Flash implementation, as many of you may know, uh, had some, or the interpreters of Flash, had some weaknesses that were exploited. And uh, at some point, it becomes too expensive, uh, perhaps, to continue to fix the bugs and to simply abandon the thing and say, I can't, uh, can't fix it, uh, and so I'm not going to try. Uh, the problem is if you or, or someone uh, else uh, relied on your software or on the uh, Adobe Flash software to produce an, an entity, an item, um, that, uh, that was of use, and then it suddenly doesn't work anymore because it doesn't work on the new versions of operating systems or the new platforms, uh, suddenly the rug is pulled out from under you. And that's another manifestation of dependency. This also goes to long-term preservation of digital content and digital objects. Uh, imagine it's 100 years from now and somebody hands you a, an ancient web page and says, uh, what's on it? And you say, well, I don't know because I don't have anything that runs the Adobe Flash or it doesn't run some other version of, uh, of JavaScript that used to work 100 years ago, but not anymore. So this idea of uh, backward compatibility and forward preservation of functionality is important and it could lead to things like um, oh, uh, escrowing of software or uh, the registration of the design of instruction set architectures for hardware so that you could replicate or at least emulate a piece of hardware so you could run an old operating system to run an old application to look at an old digital object. Uh, then there are intellectual property questions about who owns what, who's allowed to execute the software. Uh, I'm sure you can elaborate on that. So you can see, at least I hope you can see, that uh, as you begin to think about all the implications of software dependency, uh, that it has lots of ramifications which stretch over long periods of time, perhaps as many as, as centuries. And that leads finally to uh, one last observation, which is with all these potential hazards, uh, in addition to all the wonderful utility that software offers, um, we should be thinking about what is the ethics of software production. What should we be doing? What should we be committed to? So that those who rely on what we have written, our software, um, can expect it to work when they need it to work. And uh, here uh, we have all kinds of other boundary conditions. For example, maintaining software over really long periods of time has cost associated with it. So who's going to pay for that? Uh, is there some uh, role for uh, libraries or archives? Is there a role for national archive, for example? Uh, should the designers of hardware uh, place their designs in some kind of escrow so that if there is no other place to turn, you might be able to uh, find out the details of a particular instruction set architecture in order to do emulation? What about software itself? Uh, should that be archived and escrowed? so that if someone says, I'm not going to maintain it anymore, 
A third party could say, well, I will if I can have access to the source code. So I have to ask, what are the ethics that should surround software production and the companies and employees that produce that software that others are relying on? Well, I'm sure that, uh, that you could uh, add to this rather short list of uh, considerations as we think more and more about the power and utility and potential hazards of software development. And I hope in the course of this conference uh, that at least some of you will touch on those issues and perhaps come up with some uh, ideas for at least norms, if not rules, uh, or for that matter, uh, legal constraints and requirements or compliance uh, requirements uh, in order to improve uh, the safety and security of the software that people depend on. And of course, in the meantime, uh, I do hope that all of the creativity that goes along with software production well, we'll visit you uh, as, uh, as you uh, tackle the various problems that you've been asked to, uh, to solve by implementing software. And I hope that uh, some of you will have taken good notes at the conference and share them with the rest of us who aren't able to attend. I'm sorry, I really I can't be there in person. But I'm pretty sure that some of us will meet on the net.